welcome to CS 532W, 539W. They're the, they're the same course. Uh, topics in AI slash programming languages, um, probability programming is a graduate course here at UBC in computer science. My name is Frank Wood. Uh, and before we get started, I should introduce you to two people who are on um, and who will be helping out as sort of TA slash consultants uh, for the course. The first is Christian. I don't know, Christian, if you want to say hi and introduce yourself to the, to the, to the group, uh, unmute and say hi. Hey, um, I'm a third year PhD student, uh, Frank, and I've taken this course like two years ago. So I will be TAing this course. And, our, and, and it's arguably the, uh, the, the only person around who actually knows what's going on with probabilistic programming still since I'm old and feeble. Uh, so he'll, uh, he'll be extremely helpful in uh, um, uh, getting, getting you off to speed, particularly with uh, implementations and these sorts of things. Um, he has, uh, I, I've, uh, <clears throat> Welcome to new, a new postdoc into my group. His name is Berend, uh, and he'll introduce himself now. Um, Berend and Christian will be the official TA. Uh, Berend will actually do probably most of the work because he's going to be learning alongside you guys. But uh, uh, in advance of uh, um, uh, in advance of uh, when you guys are doing the homework. So, um, Berend, you want to introduce yourself? Hi guys, um, my name is Berend. Um, I'm coming from a physics background and um, I'm about to start a postdoc with Frank. Um, and most of this stuff is, is, is fairly new to me too. So uh, yeah, like Frank said, I'll be learning with you guys as well. Hopefully one step ahead. So uh, normally grad, grad courses only may, may not even have a TA, but here we are large enough that we'll have, uh, you know, something like one and a half in total and we'll work out how that actually works out as we go. Um, and, you know, again, uh, I apologize on behalf of reality for COVID and the fact that we have to do this on Zoom and that sort of stuff. Um, graduate courses are way fun because they're actually interactive and they're small and we actually get to see one another and, and you know, interact and that sort of stuff. Straight away, you'll get to know me as, we, as we're together and there's a bunch of people from my group who can attest to this. I treasure a high degree of interactivity. Um, spam stuff on the chat channel, pop in when you can. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, the, the more interaction we can have, the better, particularly with questions and these sorts of things. Um, so don't be shy. I think I can see most of you, which is, which is great. Um, and again, I think you know, the, the total enrollment is supposed to be something like 50, but you know, we'll, we'll see what ends up happening. I'm guessing it'll, <laughs> it'll drop down to the mid 20s uh, pretty quickly. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, this is the first lecture. Thanks for showing up. I appreciate it. I think you know when the time is. 3.35, Tuesdays to Thursdays. We're online thanks to COVID. Again, I apologize for that. It sucks for me. Probably worse than it sucks for you. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's worse. It's bad. It, it's very difficult to, uh, to lecture in this style with no feedback and no sound. Ugh, it's horrible. Um, I'm generally pretty inaccessible. I run a very large research group, um, but I do have staff that check my email and that sort of stuff. And if you do try, try to, to, to email me directly, please make sure that you put uh, um, explicitly this, uh, this uh, little piece of text in the subject line. Um, that way it'll come to my attention, get sorted into the right mailbox and that sort of stuff. I think maybe most importantly, we don't use Canvas. I think uh, you've, maybe you found this link on Canvas or maybe you found this link through the Faculty Service Center email that I sent out, but there is a course website. Um, that's where everything goes. That's where the homeworks are. That's where the, the syllabus is. That's where the, the, uh, the, the, the extra readings will be, so on and so forth. Uh, please bookmark it, be familiar with it. That's the, that's the place to go. <clears throat> um, so, uh, what, what is a course on probabilistic programming? Well, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, you're gonna learn a bunch of stuff for sure. Um, at the highest level, you're gonna learn a bunch of stuff that makes, that makes you either able to use probabilistic programming systems in your own research or uh, implement them for whatever reason. 
uh, or use the tools and techniques within the that, that have sort of been developed in the field of probabilistic programming to advance your research and advanced uh, machine learning methodologies or advanced uh, artificial intelligence uh, applications, these sorts of things, okay? But in particular, what we're going to, to talk about uh, or get through by the end of this course, if you don't already know how to do this sort of stuff, we will talk about how to actually write interpreters for uh, various kinds of programming languages. In particular, we'll talk about interpreters for first order and higher order languages. Um, I'm going to try to make, I don't know if, I don't know how many of you have heard the word on the street that this course has an enormous workload. Um, the first time I taught it was the first time I came here from Oxford and I put the workload at the absolute maximum because I had a huge number of graduate students coming in and trying to train them up for my group. Uh, this year, thanks to COVID and to, you know, just like to try to do the course in a slightly different way, the workload should be a little bit lower. So we're not going to do things like write a compiler. We're going to provide compilers for you and these sorts of things, but we'll talk about how they're, they're, um, they're, they're made. Uh, we will talk a fair amount about inference in general, maybe more than most computer science courses that exist at UBC right now. And we'll talk about how to write general purpose inference engines for the family of, gra of, of, of graphical models. Um, I think we're not going to write an automatic differentiation library like we did in years past. We'll use them. I think they're, they've become standard enough tools that we'll talk about how to use them and why they're useful inside of uh, the context of probabilistic programming. Um, we will talk about how to, to interpret higher order languages, sort of in the structured interpretation of computing, computer, computer languages style. And we'll talk about how to do inference in these, these kinds of high, uh, higher, um, higher order languages or programs written in higher order languages. I hope to get in stuck into your head if it isn't already um, a, an idea about what a model is and what modeling means uh, in a way that's maybe different to what you might know from CS340 or from other sort of deep learning approaches where you're doing conditional density estimation or learning a classifier or something like that. <clears throat> I hope that I'll give you enough tools to be able to use probabilistic programming systems to solve inference problems automatically. Um, that more or less I know is true that when people go through this course, they're able to then go off and use whatever tools exist. I, I will definitely solidify throughout the course of the term the relationship between generative models, stochastic simulators, decoders in the variational autoencoder context, that sort of thing. And we'll talk a lot about what inference is and ver basically various forms of inference, whether it's sampling based inference or variational inference or so on and so forth and what their characteristics are and how generally they can be applied. Kind of under the covers, and this, this is the neat, neat thing where it'll be, be a little bit less explicit about this. It comes fast and furious at various part, part, parts of the term. You'll also be exposed to a, to a variety of sort of advanced models and methods including you know, program synthesis via inference, deep structure variational autoencoders, semi and unsupervised learning, like and all kinds of advanced uh, inference methods, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, sequential Monte Carlo, variational inference, black box variational inference, so on and so forth. I hate grades. I think they're, they're, they're kind of up beside the point. They're, who cares? If you're gonna learn, you're gonna learn. Um, so it's, you know, it's with chagrin that I say that we will be grading things. Um, uh, and here's how it's going to break down. Uh, I really do want this to be participatory. I really want to know who you are at the end of this. It would be lovely if once COVID get, breaks, I can walk down the sidewalk and actually recognize some of you. And it's great that you already have your cameras on. This is a good, this is a good first step. Uh, uh, so participation is going to be marked. And the way it's going to be marked is exactly what, what you see on the screen there, I suppose, on the screen. I don't know which way to point for on, on, on your screen, but um, if I know who you are at the end of the term, you're going to get it, you know, full marks. Uh, if I don't, no marks for that. Uh, homework's 20%. And the real reason why we're all here is to do a project. And the project really is meant to be a publishable, publishable piece of work. Okay. Um, and that, that will break down in terms of writing a proposal or somewhere or maybe two thirds away through the term uh, of a research paper report, LaTeX, so on and so forth, and giving a final presentation during the exam slot. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to inflate grades. Most of you are graduate students. I have no interest in, in interfering in your, um, 
you know, in your careers, kicking you out and causing you problems, that sort of thing. So uh, most of you are going to receive A's, but, um, you know, uh, <laughs> I reserve the right to be honest. Um, cool. So uh, prerequisites, I still don't really know what the course structure is like at UBC. I still, I kind of guess numbers, that sort of stuff, like uh, course numbers. I think, you know, depending on how dedicated you are, you're going to be able to make, make it through the course. Um, I would say that you probably need to have a fairly reasonable programming languages background. Like, it wouldn't hurt to have taken an actual PL course before. Um, it wouldn't hurt to know something about Bayesian statistics. Um, and you really kind of have to have at least 340 level uh, machine learning to, to, to be able to, to hack this, right? Um, and there's no programming handholding in this course. You're, we, we tell you what to do and then you go off and do it. So you need to be a pretty proficient programmer. Uh, there's minimal requirements, but um, it, would be, it would be good if you had a little bit more in the, in the, in the gas tank before, we, before you start. In the way that Mark Schmidt uh, does it, uh, you know, <laughs> this course could ruin your life for the next four months if you don't kind of have an idea of what a graphical model is. We'll talk about it, we'll go through it. But uh, if you've never written an interpreter or a compiler, or you have no idea how programming languages are interpreted or compiled, uh, this, we're gonna go through it, but you, you need to have a little bit of a background to, to keep up at the speed we're gonna go. Um, if, you haven't be, if you haven't performed a Bayesian statistical analysis before, like never ever at all, period, not even in a course, it's gonna be a little bit difficult. Um, and again, there are programming exercises and you need to be able to do them independently and efficiently. So that's pretty important. Um, well, we're gonna cover all this stuff, but just having some baseline familiarity with it because of, we, we add a level of generality on top of all of it, which is difficult to get unless you have sort of the, the, the background. Uh, I take academic integrity pretty seriously. Uh, in COVID times, it's a little bit, uh, you know, a little, a little bit lax. The main point is do your own work. When, 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 when asked to do your own work, right? That, that, that goes without saying, right? So work collaboratively on the homeworks, work on the projects collaboratively, but make sure you actually pr pr produce work of your own. Um, don't uh, look up the solutions to the homeworks on the online, these sorts of things, it's just not, not cool. Um, positive space stuff is, uh, is, is taken very seriously as well. I like to summarize it by like, don't be a jerk. Um, I will say that I, I, uh, I've already made two mistakes in this, in this respect in the course, uh, three already in our, in our lecture. I cannot remove the term guys as a gender, gender neutral, neutral term for referring to everyone. I've tried and tried and tried. Uh, so please forgive that. I will use that as, a gender, that as a gender neutral term for me, but please, it's lovely. There's a lovely diversity here. Let's keep that diversity going, okay? Yeah, please. All right, cool. Uh, Questions? No, there shouldn't be any questions at this point. <clears throat> so, high level syllabus. So, I moved the course, and again, it doesn't really matter to you guys, you don't, you don't know, uh, but I moved the course around a little bit in response basically to the, to the, the pre course survey that I sent out. Thank you for those of you who um, uh, filled it out. Uh, there's like the section zero, which is uh, Context, motivation, as an intro, intro to prop rock, basically context, motivation, history and languages, model-based reasoning examples. And then we're going to do a bunch of review. Uh, and we're gonna do it sort of like classical style with graphical models, inference, Marco J. Monte Carlo. And we'll talk about like a model of your, we'll figure, we'll talk about how Bayesian inference was done before probabilistic programming systems. Then we'll talk about first order languages and do a bunch of stuff with them. We'll talk about compilation. We'll talk about interpretation. We'll talk about automatic differentiation, evaluation-based inference, variational inference, so on and so forth in the context of relatively simple models, denotable, you know, denotable and first order probabilistic programming languages uh, corresponding to graphical models. And then we'll move on to the, the hairy fun stuff, which are higher order languages and inference in those that corresponds to the dynamic computation graph models. And we'll talk about sequential Monte Carlo in that context and amortized inference and all sorts of stuff. Uh, at the end of the course, you will uh, have been exposed to and written big parts of several different probabilistic programming systems. So um, you would re realistically at, at, the, at the end of this course in prior years here and in other places where I've, where, where I've taught similar things, you will be able to go off and contribute to the internals of Pyro or Stan or something like that and also use them. So that's, that's great. 
when you go on the course website, there is a there's a, a syllabus that is a that's backed by a Google Sheet that I'm messing around with constantly. Um, uh, anything that's in gray is in serious flux. <laughs> Do not enter. Uh, um, you know, for those of you who are like really anxious and going to read super far in advance and like really get into it, beware that that's just subject to change. Um, frankly, all of it's subject to change, but that's really subject to change at this point still. Okay. Uh, and yeah, the links might not work in that area and that sort of thing. So don't worry about it. Coursework, roughly six homeworks. Hopefully not totally crazily onerous this 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 year, um, and the final project, which I hope is crazily onerous, but is somehow aligned with the research that you want to do, and the research that I want to do, and the research that's um, um, suggested by the course contents. Okay. Uh, grading, we do something kind of different here, um, and this is where it's like kind of UC Santa Cruz ish a little bit. Uh, uh, the first assignment we'll do is sort of standard style. It's basically a, a it, it's already out on the website. Yeah, you know, go go check it out. Um, we'll grade that normally, grade scope, that sort of thing. The rest of the evaluation uh, will be done via peer grading. Literally, we're going to pair you up with random people in the course, and you're going to look at each other's codes and each other's results and report um, report uh, um, how you did. There's a, there's a couple advantages to this. One is uh, if there are 50 people in here and only one TA, there's no way that that, that that person would ever, ever be able to do in any, of, any of their research, their graduate students as well. But also I found that this peer grading thing actually works very well to fill in gaps when people have have uh, have issues understanding something or have issues completing some sort of uh, some some part of the homework. That being said, also, just to be clear, um, in terms of professional software development, I will be doing spot checks. Um, so in other words, when you're completing your homework assignments, you're, you need to keep a version controlled set, uh, history of the code that you uh, write with the ability to, to check out whatever you submitted at whatever time and, and demonstrate it to me. Okay, So I will call random people and say, hey, time to have a meeting and show me what you did for homework three. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll go through it. So that does happen. There's, a, there's an audit process. It's a random audit, audit process. And you don't want to be caught in that because it'll be really, really ugly. And I encourage you to, to read this carefully. It's on the course website and, uh, and, and here. I know, terrible slide designs, but the, the, all the text is on the website. Right? The key idea is do the homework. Be honest about what you, uh, what you accomplished um, in your peer grading evaluations. <clears throat> if you're not, I'll find out. Uh, we will use Gradescope. Uh, and we're using the Canadian version, so it's all kosher via UBC rules, visa via UBC rules. <clears throat> the code. How many of you have seen? Have you have used Gradescope? How many of you have not? Have, or rather, how many of you have not used Gradescope? Okay, it's simple. Go to Gradescope.ca, sign up using that thing. The critical part for us is that for your username, you must use your CWL, and that's totally fine. And it would be extremely convenient if you also associate your student ID number with your account internally. That's something you can do inside. Um, for those of you who don't know this, if you're unaware of this, <laughs> Gradescope, Faculty Service Center, and the comp in internal computer science uh, uh, tools for identifying who are in courses are not synchronized in any sort of a way. And when we grade in Gradescope and then have to upload your grades, we have to be able to do a manual merge between the two. So if things are not in alignment, things are bad. And Gregory, who's on the line uh, in, in, uh, in, in the course, has TA'd with me in a course where this did not go well. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not, it's not good for anybody. It's not good for me. It's not good for you, uh, you know, so on and so forth. Gregory, can you confirm? Uh, sure. Yeah, a lot of people had duplicate accounts and everything. So yeah. Use identifiable information, right? 
whatever you use in the UBC system, please don't make account names with random, random other names. You've got a preferred name. You've got all, you can call yourself whatever you want from the UBC system. That's totally cool. If you have a preferred name and a last, just use whatever you use in the UBC system. Make it super identifiable. Okay. No funny usernames. Okay. Uh, relative to grading, there's no late, late, late homeworks accepted, period. They don't account for that much of the grade. Doesn't really matter. Uh, can't be bothered. Uh, pure grading is to be done on the due date. Okay. So feel, failure to pure grade, pure, pure grading is super simple. It takes probably half an hour unless there's major problems you want to talk about it, right? Um, you'll get a zero for it. The solutions generally will not be distributed. So we'll have some support code and stuff like that that we'll put out, but we'll not, dis not, to, not distribute solutions to make it easier to, to conduct the, the course in, in subsequent years. You're free to move around your code base. If you like, if you find out that somebody has an awesome code base and you want to use their code base, you can do that after you submit. Um, and the coding projects are generally meant to be cumulative. So, you know, again, professional software development practices, um, good idea. Um, it's not as bad as last year uh, or two years ago. Project, it's a research project. So it's meant to be a semester long, very significant piece of work that demonstrates your developed understanding of probabilistic programming. General aim should be a, your pro for the project to be published in a top tier machine learning programming language, statistics, vision, natural language processing, or similar conference, okay? We really want you to actually produce research work, okay? Um, you might build on the code that you built for the, the homeworks. Uh, I'd say it's 50-50 this year, probably. Maybe less, maybe 40-60. It's not imperative that the uh, research project is successful. Um, uh, high marks will be much more easily achieved for ambitious and interesting projects that fail in telling and well in, in fail in telling in well documented ways than safe projects that produce an expected but positive result. Um, relatively small groups to keep the, the credit assignment problem easier uh, is are, are preferred. A couple of people that would be great, but you can work in in teams of up to to four. Um, uh, but bear in mind that I will expect, you know, super linear um, output from a team that 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 that's that's large like that. There are three types of projects that are okay. Um, there is always the opportunity to to develop an actual new system or expand the capabilities of an existing system in an, in an interesting way. This is not really a research project per se. It's a little bit difficult to publish. In the, in the standard um, uh, uh, venues that I just talked about. But it's uh, a, an opportunity that you are afforded in this course. And it's a kind of an, a very, very interesting one. There's, I have specific ideas that I can talk to you about um, uh, uh, as we go. And Naomi, Naomi uh, had a question. Can we work in groups for the project or is it individual? No, very explicitly the project is meant to be a group thing. You, and I'm not going to explicitly schedule all of you to find your group partners. Um, I've set up a Piazza thing largely for you to talk amongst yourselves and meet one another so that you can find your, your project partners and so on and so forth. We'll put project ideas out there eventually as we get a little bit further into the course, um, so on and so forth. So yes, please work together um, with people. Uh, uh, great. I'm, I am an AI slash ML researcher. So it's totally cool if you want to develop a novel artificial intelligence application using an existing system. So in other words, you can use a probabilistic programming system, but do something interesting and novel using a probabilistic programming system. That's fine. Um, and underneath, as we get going, you'll start to understand that the challenges of probabilistic programming, particularly with respect to inference, are daunting uh, in general. Uh, and there's an opportunity to make fundamental algorithmic or methodological contributions to the field. And I'm totally down with that as well. Um, so those are the three types of projects that are, that are okay. Um, for those of you who are, you know, biomedical engineering or something like that, you might want to do an application project. For those of you who are, you know, in my group, which I think uh, how many of you are in, the, in here that are in my group right now? Three, four, five, something like that, you know probably some fundamental algorithmic or uh, algorithm or methodological development. If you're, you know, a, a master's student on the, you know, uh, let's get it, let's get a professional degree and get out of here, then maybe you want to show off being able to implement a, a really cool system so you can put it on your, uh, you know, github.io page or something like that. That's totally cool as far as I'm concerned as well. Um, but it's got to be real and significant, right? The deliverables. Um, besides the software, 
are uh, write-ups that are uh, that basically use modern. Uh, oof, there's another mistake. Um, modern uh, conference um, uh, uh, formatting, LaTeX, so on and so forth. So we'll do, we'll write a four-page proposal in NeurIPS conference format. Excuse me for that. Um, and a 10 page publication quality paper in the same format um, uh, later in the basically due at the final exam period. And then depending on the size of the course, there'll be something like a, a 20 minute final presentation where you discuss publicly what you did. Schedule for this, um, the 23rd of March, the proposal will be due. That also will be su submitted uh, electronically to Gradescope. There's a little bit of a funny process that we'll talk about later where if your proposal sucks, I'll make you do another one and I'll make you keep, keep doing it until you propose something that's actually okay and interesting. Final exam period, we have no idea when that is, that you know, we'll figure it out eventually. That's when the presentations and project will be due. And you know, again, the course website will have all of this um, and it's highly subject to change, so great. There are all sorts of resources you should, you know, you know, get get uh, get going straight away. Think about systems, so on and so forth. There's lots of systems out there: Anglican, Pyro, Web People, Edward, Stand, Piprob. We'll talk about some of them. These are names that you'll become familiar with throughout the uh, the term. Uh, <clears throat> as everybody in my group knows, um, it, I have written the first book on probabilistic programming. It's called The Introduction to Probabilistic Programming. Uh, the link is there. You can just Google it. It's Introduction to Probabilistic Programming. Uh, it's not in review. We've just been struggling to finish it because it's really, really hard to finish. Um, and my goal is to have it done by the time we need things to be done in this, in this course, uh, which should be pretty doable given that we only need to finish one chapter and it's written. I just need to edit it basically. So you can download the book now, but you'll be getting uh, updated copies of it as we as we go. That basically add chapters uh, should add two chapters to the book. Okay, so uh, read the book; it should be accessible. Um, and honestly, reading it will probably be better than listening to me lecture. So why would you take the course? Uh, besides the fact that I'm awesome, uh, is uh, <laughs> that you might want to work with me or other researchers like me around the world. Okay. And I'm kind of in this weird camp of like Tenenbaum, Goodman, Griffiths, Garamani, Jordan. I don't know if you know how many of you know those names, but sort of Bayesian machine learning, Bayesian deep learning, deep generative models slash whatever. Um, if you want to do advanced probabilistic machine learning research, you're going to get what you need from this, this course. Uh, if you want to dramatically incre increase your productivity as an applied Bayesian, by becoming a true expert in probabilistic programming so that you can use this, the tools and systems that are available to you super efficiently. Obviously, if you want to write a paper, I, the ideal outcome for me and for all of you is that all of every single one of you is actually on a submitted paper. If that works, we're, we're golden. If you put my name on it, it's even better, right? Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> And like, if you're sort of dissatisfied with uh, deep learning, modern deep learning, and you think maybe there's more, there's more to life than, than, than just, uh, you know, the deep learning that you see, uh, there is, and it comes in the form of deep generative models and probabilistic programming. And that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. Reason not to take the course, workload's high. Um, there is more doing it. This is not a seminar course. Um, last, last time there was half seminar. I've stripped out the seminar. I'm going to basically lecture the whole time because of COVID and this kind of crap. Oh, yawning. Is that, man, am I so boring already? Let's see if I caught the yawn. Let's see. Uh, yep. That was, an, that was a big time yawn from Adam. Okay. All right. The first yawn. <laughs> um, and generally speaking, although less this time, it's it, it like, this is really kind of as every graduate course is, but let's be honest about it. It's really about training incoming graduate students to work with their, the, the PI and that for that reason, you know, the course is basically designed to talk about things that I think are important and interesting and so on and so forth. So uh, maybe you'll disagree with me about what things are important or interesting, um, in which case drop the course. Uh, more reasons not to take the course. Uh, this is only the second time I've given this course at UBC. Uh, and it usually takes about five times of, of giving a course before a course becomes actually good. Um, so 
it'll still be a little rough around the edges. That's totally, totally fine. And also, we're still trying to set the level. Like there isn't 440 yet. I don't know how many of you have heard about CS440 when that's going to happen, but there's going to be a probable an undergraduate, uh, prob uh, you know, probabilistic machine learning course. It doesn't exist yet. Uh, so I kind of have to somehow weirdly level set probabilistic programming to pick up that material quickly, but I still need to talk about the prob prog stuff. So it's, there's a lot that will come pretty fast and you're going to have to fill in the gaps yourself. For implementation of stuff, um, when you read the book uh, uh, and you see what we talk about during class, we're going to be working with Lispy style languages. In particular, we'll use cloture syntax. Uh, many of you come from the computer science department, and many of you actually have UBC backgrounds, which means that that won't be a problem. Some of you do not, and you're going to run into the Lispy thing and be like, what in God's name is going on? Um, you have a kind of a devil's choice straight away, um, which is to say that um, when you do your homeworks and so on and so forth, there are, there are some major uh, pros that will come from using Clojure to do your, to do your homeworks. Um, you'll have some advantages in terms of coding efficiency. You don't have to write parsers. You, know, you, can, like, you can use existing primitives. There's straightforward metaprograms, so on and so forth. And everything is very similar to the book. The cons are it's not Python, <laughs> right? Um, and because of that, and there's the, there's another con, which is that the automatic differentiation systems that exist in Clojure suck. Like there's like basically no deep learning support. Um, I, I tend to agree with uh, James, uh, and I was actually hoping, in particular, because I do know who you are. I you know I you know you're a known quantity, sort of. Um, that you might say that. And in fact, maybe a, a course project straight away, just to put it out there, would be to make the, the automatic differentiation slash deep learning systems in Clojure not suck. And you would be my hero because then I could never have to program in Python, which would make me incredibly happy. Um, so, so other possibilities that would be re reasonable, you know, uh, F sharp, Pascal, Python, JavaScript, Julia, sorry, Christian, I forgot to put it on the slides here. Everybody's, everybody's a big fan of Julia in, in the group. Uh, do not use <laughs> Java, C++, or C in this course. Just don't. It would be horrible. OK, questions at this point? Nothing? All right, cool. So who are you? That's, uh, that's the... That's the <laughs> That's the question we all face. So um, this is the information that I'm going on. Uh, I've got 16 responses. Thank you for those of you who did. Um, a bunch of your computer scientists, no statisticians, which I find actually really, really surprising. Are there any statisticians actually here? No, okay, crazy, okay. Some electrical engineers, some applied mathematicians, some biomedical engineers, great. How likely are you to drop? Um, it looks like most of you are in for the long haul, although there's a seven here, which which doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't strike me as particularly committed. I don't feel like uh, we're likely to have a long term relationship if you're at the seven level, whoever that is. You don't have to identify yourself. That's totally fine. Um, this is why I've decided to restructure the term, and I think it, we had this experience when I um, uh, when I taught the course before. Not surprisingly, we're in a computer science department. More computer scientists takes the course than statisticians. Um, have you ever derived or coded a, a sampler for a Bayesian model before? I think, um, you know, unless you're in the Trump verse, um, this more or less directly says no, right? If you're Trump, this would say yes, everybody's done it. But like here, it's like pretty clear that most people have um, not done this, right? And and thank you for the maybe my undergrad thesis used Bayesian sampling and Markov processes. For whoever whoever put that in, I, I <laughs> you don't have to identify yourself. Um, I would say that qualifies as a yes, so that's that that that's fine. Um, but uh, that's good. Have you ever written or a, an interpreter or a compiler before? Now this, frankly, actually is embarrassing for computer scientists. Um, although uh, truth be told, um, uh, I graduated from Cornell in computer science for my under, un, undergraduate and never wrote an, uh, an interpreter or compiler while I was at Cornell either. Um, but it's still hideously embarrassing. 
And you should be ashamed of yourselves as computer scientists for not having done that if you haven't. Um, it is absolutely essential for understanding computer science that you actually do this at least once in your career. Uh, and thankfully, you'll have the opportunity to do it at least once, maybe twice. Um, uh, and if you do an awesome project, three times, three, and the third time's the charm. Have you ever written a probabilistic program? Now, this is a little bit surprising because 25% of you say that you've written a probabilistic program, um, but fewer of you say that you've ever done uh, I guess, like, I guess technically, I guess it's okay because you haven't actually derived your code at a sampler for a Bayesian model. You can write a probabilistic program and use it anyway. I'm guessing most of these people are people who took Wolfman's course. How many of you have taken Wolfman's course? All right, a couple of you. All right, that's probably it right there. So beautifully uh, at UBC, some of the prob prog material has been pushed down into the programming languages courses here. Um, uh, uh, as like the hard stuff you have to do in the programming languages course. Um, so we're just going to do more of that. So I guess technically they have, uh, we'll see, we'll find out. Do you have a project idea for the course? Nobody has any idea what they're going to do. Well, that's not true. One person has an idea and I think I know who it is. Um, and I don't think he's here, which is pretty bad because he's in my group. Uh, so next time we, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's this. Uh, there's a student of mine named Payman Bateni. Um, next time, seriously, when we when we all get on and when he actually shows up, everybody needs to write in the chat. Hey, where where were you, Payman? Like, just you know, just nail him with it. Okay, he really he deserves it. So he's the one who has the. He, he knows what he wants to do. Okay. So that's <laughs> seriously. Where's where where were you, Payman? We 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 missed you. Uh, cool. All right, so I, I hate to admit that I was like 35 before I understood what TLDR meant. So that means too long, didn't read. Um, so the entire course can be summarized like this. Programming languages can be used to denote inference problems. There are at least two families and we're going to organize the course in terms of this demarcation, and it's an important one. There are at least two families of probabilistic programming languages. One that basically corresponds to graphical models. How many of you know what graphical models are? Uh, uh, I don't even know how to do this. Uh, the ish, not very many, a couple, right? Um, so we'll talk about graphical models in detail in a little while. I think two lectures from now, we'll talk about them. <clears throat> uh, Another way of saying what a graphical model is, is a finite dimensional probabilistic model. In other words, a probability model with a finite number of random variables okay? uh, with graphically denotable structure. So uh, one that can be compiled to graphical models or factor graphs, which is basically just another uh, formalism similar to graphical models. Uh, the other uh, correspond to sort of your normal notion of what a uh, uh, programming language is, it, it is. So models denotable in Python or C or C++ or Julia or whatever. Uh, things that look more like regular programming languages or simulators, something like that. It's possible to develop generic and reasonably efficient inference algorithms for both families. It's very difficult, and that those inference algorithms are, tend to be a little bit more general, and uh, um, they just tend to be, uh, they have greater requirements than bespoke inference algorithms for bespoke models, for particular models. And the reason why I got into probabilistic programming, I, I could go through my entire history, it would bore, bore all of you probably, but it's certainly the case that there's a there's a, a, a super interesting and rapidly growing connection between probabilistic programming, variational inference, and differentiable programming that I personally think is necessary to achieve like AI, but also is giving rise to the next generation of AI tools. So everybody knows TensorFlow and PyTorch and, and so on and so forth. Um, we're not at, yet at the point where everybody knows Pyro or everybody knows um, uh, What's the MIT one, Christian? Uh, Jen, uh, or Turing, or Anglican, or PyProb. Nobody cares about Anglican anymore, PyProb. Um, but at some point, somebody will design the system that everybody does care about, and it will be very, very widely used. Um, 
that's sort of fun. And it's also kind of interesting from a research and like, uh, like career perspective in that there's all kinds of interesting research and engineering problems that are left in probabilistic programming. So like deep learning, eh, I don't know, research is kind of boring, right? You like better architecture, more TPUs, better data, bleh, okay? Here, there are actually fundamental research problems that are, that, are, that are still left, that are actually research problems rather than just, you know, can we compete with Google or Facebook, right? Um, okay, so let's put a little context in here, some motivation, history, and languages, and, and call it a day. So there, there is this, you know, undeniable deep learning revolution that's, that's happened, happening, happened somewhere like that. Um, has that has that bar for the like the the pencils been there the entire time? And uh, nobody yeah. said nobody yeah, pretty said, much. Nobody said, "Hey, close the thing." Come on, right? That's like, uh, I thought maybe you'd want to use it. Who knows? That's a, that's like that's like me walking around with toilet paper on my shoe. Come on, I mean, it's like this is recorded. This is this this is out there for posterity forever, right? Uh, you got to help me out here, right? Uh, okay. So the deep learning revolution, uh, what's it about, right? Well, it's really started with the big data revolution thing. And, uh, and to be perfectly honest, when I was first starting as an academic, people were writing grant reports and so on, and grant, grant proposals around and so forth, talking about big data, big data, big data, big data. And I was like, what are you guys, what, what, who cares? What are you on about? Well, it doesn't really matter. Well, it turns out that big data plus some other stuff, which happened actually after the big data thing, makes a big, big difference, right? So you got big data, really, really fast computers, um, some you know neural net program scaffolds, uh, and what I mean by this are like partially specified programs, which, which is to say like the the PyTorch program that you have, where you go off and you train a bunch of the parameters of the program, plus some differentiation tools. Now the fun thing about these differentiation tools, this, uh, these are automatic differentiation tools. These tools are actually tools derived from the programming languages community, and they've been around since like the 50s or 60s, okay, something like that. So we take Computers have gotten faster. We take a bunch of data that, 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 you know, like various companies and whatever. We build some programming languages tools and bang, we have these new fang companies, right? And, and first generation artificial intelligence, like, and it's pretty amazing what, what can be done. Now, <clears throat> Jan LeCun has started using one of my old postdocs terminology um, for, uh, for deep learning, he's talking about it in terms of what, what, what you would call differentiable programming, right? And it's basically the combination of automatic differentiation and optimization gives you this differentiable programming thing where you can learn the parameters of programs, right? The question is like, what are the, what, what is the tool chain that actually gets us to, you know, AI writ large, whatever that is, right? Many of us believe that the automation of inference and being able to denote inference problems and so on and so forth is, is fundamental and crucial. Um, and basically inferences to probabilistic programming is optimization is to differentiable programming. We use programming languages, ideas and constructs to denote problems. And then we automate the solution of those problems via algorithms that apply in the general case. So differentiable programming is that you have some nonlinear function approximation that you'd like to accomplish. Um, you use optimization to do that and gradient based, uh, 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 gradient based optimization to do that, automatic differentiation, so on and so forth. Probabilistic programming again, you have a language uh, that specifies an inference problem and then you have evaluators that solve the inference problem for you. Then you can express reinforcement learning as inference and so on and so forth. Who knows where, where, we, where, this, where this ends. Uh, oh, another, another update. You can tell how out of date these slides are by um, my increasing age and frailty. So how many of you have ever heard of the, the Helmholtz machine? Whoa. Okay, well, obviously, Christian, you have clearly. Oh, and Ryan is, is using without video on. Thanks, Ryan. I told you to leave, leave, leave video. Adam, why, why do you know what the, uh, what do you, what, where, where have you heard about the Helmholtz machine? I feel like it's something that was covered in 540 or at least mentioned. Uh, probably in my guest lecture, if you were there when I gave a guest, <laughs> a guest lecture. Oh, and James had a question. Uh, this is a different James. I don't think I know this James. Uh, do I know this James? I don't think so. Um, not yet. 
are Bayes nets graphical models? Yes, basically. Um, uh, uh, okay. This is kind of a weird transition. Why would I? Why would I have this here? So, there's this really important idea that's been floating around for a long time. And if you if you look, of course, now I actually need. <laughs> How do I get it back? That's funny. Does anybody know how to get the little pen back in Keynote? Okay, cool. Um, that didn't work. All right, so the, the, there's this idea. Let's let's look first of all for at, at a couple of symbols, and then we're going to talk about some symbols that we use throughout the course. Um, so there's this Y here. The Y are going to be observed variables for us. Okay, they're the things that we observe about the world, and we're going to talk about AI for just a second, right? And, and use this as a as a motivation for for probabilistic programming. So that's a picture of me. That's actually what I look like when I don't look like Santa Claus. Um, so there's a picture of me, right? Now <clears throat> there's this like. Uh, uh, this classifier slash encoder slash inference artifact, so on and so forth, that somehow should be able to go from observational data like Y and make sense of it, okay? And that's the, the arrow on the left-hand side of the, the screen, the encoder, this Q of thing, this P of X given Y, so on and so forth. And what you should, uh, what an agent in the world should be able to do is be able to, to look at the, the world and then make sense of it. In this particular case, uh, you can tell that I gave the course three years ago because I'm now 46, not 43. I'm still kind of pudgy, despite being on a on a, on a uh, doing that. Uh, what you might call it? What do you when you don't eat occasionally? Thing, uh, yeah, that that thing. I'm doing that. I'm still white. I'm still mostly bald, and I'm still male. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> we make sense of the world through some sort of computational process, which does inference about the state of the world. It goes off and finds, you know. Latent variables like you can't directly observe that I'm 46, but you can probably infer it from how I look. You can't directly observe maleness, but you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, infer it by from from what you what you see. Right now, <clears throat> the Helmholtz machine was to, was proposed actually by this by by you know like you know Radford Neal, Jeff Hinton, Peter Diane, Rich Zemmel, so on and so forth. People that are heavily involved in the deep learning community. It's that basically the way that you make sense of the world is that you have two bits going on. One, you have a model of the world that allows you to actually generate the world, a generative model of the world that starts from the latent variables X and then allows you to actually generate uh, uh, observations, right? And these two, two pieces play hand in hand together in a way that will become apparent as we go on. And the thing on the right, this generative model of the world, this decoder goes from X to Y. Uh, it goes from the latents to the observes and it serves many, many purposes. It serves to regularize, it serves to generate new training data for the, for the, for the, the encoder. It, uh, there's lots of reasons for it, but this decoder thing is a model and the encoder thing is an inference artifact, okay? And probabilistic programming at the, at its core is about being able to computationally to, to specify in a sort of a, a, in a deep learning kind of way, both an encoder and a decoder uh, that are arbitrarily flexible, arbitrary, like we don't know what programming languages constructs are used there, so on and so forth, aren't necessarily differentiable and we still need to be able to work with them, okay? So the Helmholtz machine gave rise to a variational autoencoder. How many of you have heard of variational autoencoders or, or dealt with variational encoder? Okay, a few of you, again, don't worry. I'm just trying to put us uh, in a, in a uh, context. Uh, um, yeah, I, sorry, James, I, I see that you said that you took 340 with me. Um, uh, there are literally 600 people who have taken uh, 340 with me um, in the last uh, two years. So uh, I apologize. Um, 
So the variational autoencoder is basically a, a, a realization of a, of, of a Helmholtz machine, and it features amortized inference and end-to-end -end variational unsupervised learning, where you basically have a data set of observations Y, and you simultaneously learn an encoder and a decoder, so on and so forth, and you have a variational objective. Okay. So probabilistic programming is related to this whole Helmholtz machine slash variational autoencoder thing. You'll come back to these slides later on and, and understand what's going on. Um, in that traditional probabilistic programming says, okay, we're going to actually start with the model. We're going to start with the, the decoder. We're going to start with a thing that we write down that goes from latent and describes how the world is generated, okay? And this is a, a traditional statistical analysis kind of a view. I would put this up front, front because we want to talk about AI stuff straight away. But we go from latents and we generate observations. And, and if you think about what that is, that's kind of like a, a simulator. It's, it's whatever, right? You, if you write a, a program that allows you to, to take some parameters in, which might be random or random initialization, or so on and so forth, and then generate whatever quantity or, or uh, thing of interest is, that's, that's great. That's your model of the world. That is actually a model, okay? That's basically what the first chapter of the book is about. And it's much more coherent than these, these lecture slides now that I think about it. But if you have a model of the world, then you can understand new observations by performing inference in that model. So in other words, you can go from Y and get a distribution, a posterior distribution over X, okay? So probabilistic programming is about, in the, in the first instance, traditional probabilistic programming is about writing down a model and then using general purpose Bayesian inference to approximate the posterior distribution over the latents given the observes, okay? And there's a ton of, ton of stuff there. Um, more modern approaches to probabilistic programming uh, <clears throat> say, okay, um, we, have, we start with a model, but we want to do inference really, really fast. And that starts to look a lot more like a variational autoencoder. And then there's one step beyond this where, where, you, um, uh, where you learn both. And we'll get to that nearer the end of the course. But anyway, probabilistic programming really sits at the intersection of machine learning, statistics, programming languages, and AI, we steal inference and theory from statistics. We get algorithms and applications from machine learning. We get deep learning from AI. We get evaluators and semantics and programming languages. They smack them all together, and that's probabilistic programming. Intuitively, what's going on? Um, in computer science, when we write programs, right? The programs have some parameters. They have some environment in which they're evaluated. They, they have a, a command line interface, or they have you can think of just a procedure as having some arguments, right? <clears throat> then you have your whole program, whatever that happens to be, it can have stochastic elements, so on and so forth. And you run that program forward. And this is what I mean by the, the, uh, the decoder basically, right? So you have a simulator for whatever you want. Um, you have a, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, name some simulators. You have a, a procedural graphics program. You have a, uh, you know, a computational fluid dynamics simulator. You have a simulator of the of of some physics ph phenomena. You have a simulator of of how people walk around. You have a game engine, so on and so forth. It has some parameters. You write a program, and it produces some output. Right? Fine. In statistics, and again, I think many of you have not done statistical analyses, so we need to sort of uh, maybe I should even just start with 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 those lectures next time. <clears throat> In statistics, generally speaking, you have some observed output. You have some data that you'd like to understand. And then you write down a model, a generative model of that data. And that generative model usually looks like a, a likelihood and a prior here. The likelihood is y, p of y given x, and the prior is p of x. Uh, and what you'd like to do is you'd like to figure out what aspects of the world gave rise to the observation. So here, the model, who knows what the model might be. Um, it could be a uh, uh, you know, a, a clustering model, you have some data and you'd like to know what clusters uh, uh, the data uh, came from, how to describe the cluster. So X would be the, the, the descriptions of the clusters and Y would be the, uh, the full observed data. And we have a, a model that we write down, great. In probabilistic programming, what we do is we actually do statistics using the tools of, of computer science. So 
um, the output of the program are the observations. So we have, we can write down whatever program we want, a simulator, we can write down a, uh, you know, a simulator of a graphical model, we can write down whatever we want. The model takes the form of a program, but what we're interested in is not the output of the program. We're actually given the output of the program. What we're interested in are the parameters or, or inputs to the program. In particular, we're interested in the posterior distribution over those, right? And we're going to use the tools of Bayesian inference to get to those, okay? So <laughs> um, what is a probabilistic program? Uh, so a probabilistic program is, is some usual functional or imperative program with a couple of added constructs. And this is a quote from Andy Gordon, who's a Microsoft research uh, researcher, so very involved in probabilistic programming traditionally. So the, the differences are one, and this is actually common to regular programming languages, you have the ability to draw ran, values at random from distribution. So you have random number generators, but the critical part is that you have the ability to condition values of variables in a, in a program via observations, okay? So uh, this means that we're going to be doing inference. We're not running programs forward, we're gonna be running programs backwards. We're going to use, use the tools of Bayesian inference to give us distributions over the inputs given the outputs of a program. So what are the goals of the field? Uh, this is this is this is old work, but it's still it's still relevant. <coughs> As you'll see, particularly when you do the first homework assignment, and we're we we are pretty light on in that homework assignment. Actually, we're pretty nice. Um, As you work on various kinds of probabilistic models, generative models, decoders, simulators, whatever you whatever you want. Um, the level of complexity of the code that you have to write in order to perform inference in those models goes way, way up. So in this particular plot, there's, um, my pen ran out of charge, that's why it didn't work. Um, uh, there are a bunch of different, um, there are a bunch of different models here. So collapsed LDA, you'll figure out what latent Dirichlet alloc allocation is relatively soon. Dirichlet process con conjugate mixture and, uh, you know, um, a probabilistic deterministic infinite and automata, there's automata induction, a hierarchical pit manure process language model, a dependent Dirichlet process mixture of objects, object tracking models, so on and so forth. The amount of code that you have to write in order to actually write down the generative model and inference procedures for that generative model and so on and so forth is absolutely enormous in most cases. You have to write thousands and thousands of lines of code in order to actually operate with these kinds of models. Whereas in this particular case, this was a study we did in Anglican, which is one of the probabilistic programming languages that came out of my group at, at, at Oxford. Um, the, the number of lines of code that you have to write in order to write down the problem, write down the model, and actually perform inference in the model is an order of magnitude less in most cases, maybe, maybe two orders of magnitude less. Okay? So if you want to work with probabilistic models and do inference, which again, is a, you know, maybe you believe is important, maybe you don't believe is important. Um, for those of us who do believe that it's important for AI, so on and so forth, then you really want to have tools that make it much, much easier. So this is sort of like bat, this is the difference uh, when you're doing like gradient based optimization things where you actually had to derive and code your own gradients versus using PyTorch or, or TensorFlow where the gradients are computed for you using automatic differentiation. That's kind of the, 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 the goal, one of the goals of probabilistic programming. And the way you get that is that you have this, you know, this programming languages ab abstraction layer between the models that you specify. And here the model is going to be a joint distribution over latents and observes. These, these are graphical models. Again, we're gonna go into this in detail in the next, next uh, lecture or two, uh, two lectures from now. We want to be able to denote those in a uniform consistent language that allows us to manipulate them and automate inference for them. So <clears throat> the, the point is, if you have such an abstraction layer, and this is a standard, you know, standard trick from program from computer science, right? If you have a, an, if you define an interface, then once you have the interface, you can operate on objects that are defined in that interface. And languages are the ultimate interface because they define formal mathematical objects. And those mathematical objects can be manipulated because they have a uniform interface. And the language for defining such objects is a programming language. And we're going to talk about designs of programming languages that allow us to specify all kinds of different kinds of models. Okay. And this, the, the breadth of this will be uh, breathtaking for some of you. Okay. 
the point though is, and the, where we'll spend most of our time are uh, in, in talking about evaluators that automate Bayesian inference given mathematical objects specified in this, in this programming languages abstraction layer. And what you'll find, some of you, some fraction of you will become adherents <laughs> and, and you'll fully drink the Kool-Aid uh, and, and recognize that this is a hammer that you can use to, 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 to solve a very, very large number of problems, right? Now is the hammer uh, it, it, you know, totally done at this point? No, probabilistic programming is still a research area and there's an opportunity to make better hammers still. But we've been at it for a long time, and I don't know how many of you will, will recognize some of these some of these things. Uh, starting way back with Simula, which is basically kind of like a C plus plus with random number generators. It's not really a proper system because it doesn't have uh, um, uh, doesn't have conditioning. <coughs> there's a uh, you know I haven't updated the slide. There's 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 more. I had for instance, Gen isn't on here, and so on and so forth. Um, Turing isn't on here, but the fields of programming languages, AI, machine learning, and statistics have all had ideas like this. Okay, how many of you have heard of bugs? Oh, another yawn. Oh, that's a Naomi. But Naomi on. Okay, how many of you have heard of bugs? One. Okay, Christian. I, I don't want to. Christian, it's no fair. You you've heard of all of these, obviously, right? Um, so statistics has bugs, win bugs, Jags, Stan, and Libby. How many of you have used or heard of Stan? Okay, so we'll cut right to the chase. If you're gonna go off and do an applied project using a probabilistic programming system, you might as well just go off and start using STAN. If you haven't heard of it, just look it up right now. Go ahead and you know, like type it in. You're, if you're like thinking I'm going to do my biomedical engineering, you know, whatever in a system or my finance degree thing in whatever, um, or you know, my modern languages thing, STAN, Stan is, a, is a good, good, uh, 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 yeah, and let me put Pyro and Gen on here uh, and Pyro. And they're roughly in that, in that, in that range. If you're going to, you know, uh, machine learning. So I've been involved basically starting in 2013, 2014 in the, in, in the field. There's been an explosion in machine learning. Uh, my group put out Anglican probabilistic C. Um, we were involved in it in um, venture. We did probabilistic ML, Haskell, and Scheme. Now we have PyProb, Pyro, and Gen. Uh, there's also Turing out here. I should have put those on here. That's really bad. Um, if you're going to do an applied project where you have something other than a differentiable model and, a, and you're not doing statistics, but you want to do something with simulators, um, if you're a Python person, you should look at PyProb and, and, and Pyro right away. Um, and if you're a Julia person, you should look at Turing and Gen right away. Um, if you're a logic person and you think that uh, logic is the way to go, you should look at, 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 at Problog. If you want large scale stuff and you care about loopy belief propagation or something like that, then you should look at infer.net. Um, these are all languages that are that are actually used by relatively large communities. Um, the ideas that we're gonna talk about are, are in the syntax of Anglican, um, but the syntax is uh, are relatively irrelevant for the things that we'll be talking about, you'll, as you'll see. Okay, a little early today, that's totally fine. We can have a little discussion, that's fine. So uh, it's the beginning, lecture one, wrap up. Course will be hard. It'll be rewarding. Promise. Um, Prog Prog is an established and growing field. Next year, the Prog Prog conference um, is uh, archival for the first time. So there is a, a venue specifically for this work now, which is which is cool. Um, uh, and Prog Prog and deep neural networking are colliding in really really interesting ways, uh, particularly when we uh, when when you think about uh, unsupervised and reinforcement learning, both of which are the things that we mostly work on in, in my group, uh, using the, the tools and techniques from probabilistic programming. So uh, questions, uh, comments? That's it for today. Um, questions, comments?
Otherwise, we can uh, go home or go ski. Um, could, could you highlight some applications of probabilistic programming? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's what we're going to do next, next time. Um, I don't have them on this mach on, on my iPad, so it's not going to be super easy. Um, so, so if you do actual applied Bayesian statistics, um, let me stop, stop this and I'll just talk to you. Um, how do I do this? Uh, If you do actual applied Bayesian statistics, then uh, basically all applied Bayesian statistics now is done using Stan. Um, there's very, very little uh, that doesn't use Stan. So wh whether it's um, whether it's predicting elections, <laughs> uh, uh, whether it's um, you know. Uh, uh, doing uh, like uh, uh, R not determination for COVID infections um, or other sorts of inference about what's going on with um, uh, uh, in various municipalities in terms of, uh, of COVID. These are these are applications um, on the. Fine, there's a huge number of fine, it's kind of a weird thing. It's like wherever you, um, effectively at this point, anywhere you use inference, and the problem is that many of you might, might not understand where one and how one forms an inference problem. But basically anywhere you use inference, um, prop prog systems show up now. So, <clears throat> um, and, almost everything can be formed frame, framed as inference. So the, the examples that I'll, that I'll talk about uh, later um, involve things like uh, directed procedural graphics. So if you write, um, uh, if you write a, if you write a, program that generates trees or something like that for a video game, right? And you have directorial control that says that the tree shouldn't like grow in a particular direction because it's going to intersect a building or something like that, right? Uh, those procedural graphics programs that have constraints built in, those are all now prob prog systems, okay? Um, they're all backed by, by, by custom prob prog systems. Um, if you have a stochastic simulator for a physical system, so my group, like a couple of the example applications that come out of my group, um, I guess I have, I have 18 minutes. Let me open up a different slide deck really quickly. Just to, uh, uh, I'll do this. This, this may be, maybe I should just do that. Okay. Yeah. I don't really think about um, here. Oh, one second. Okay, my computer is freaking out. Wow. Am I dead or am I still? still going. We can still hear you. My computer is, I, um, I don't know what's happening. Uh, Okay, that seems to have come back. Is that, are we back? Yeah, we're back. Okay, uh, that was very weird, whatever happened. Um, 
And I think I'm sharing this screen, yes? Yeah, you can see the screen? Yeah. Okay, so, so yeah, actually I spent a lot of my time talking about case studies for PropProg and maybe I should just start with this because that's what we, that's what we care about. This is, a large, this is the Atlas detector on a large hadron collider, okay? Um, one of the things that my group has done is say, take the standard model or the Atlas detector simulator, which is about 1 million lines of C++ code, which allow you to go from like a, a distribution over Feynman diagrams, uh, basically like what, what high energy uh, particle interactions uh, constituent productions are as the, the particle shower undergoes transitions. Um, and a simulator of, of Atlas detector componentry. This would be a prior distribution over what happens in the, in the Atlas detector main beam line and what, occur, what actually shows up in the detector elements on the, on the main beam line. Uh, and using PyProb, which is one of the languages that came out of my Oxford group, um, we're able to invert that. Um, and I'm going to try to press play here and see whether or not it actually shows up on this screen. It probably is going to show up on the other screen because I really want to. Sh oh, oh, I got lucky. Awesome. Um, so we're able to take an event and uh, invert the Sherpa and the, 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 the detector simulator to uh, derive a fast uh, approximate posterior distribution over all the physical quantities of interest in the collision, basically um, uh, inverting the standard model and telling you, for instance, what the, the, the momenta of particles were that, that, uh, that um, happened in, in the, the collision. So why is this interesting? Um, this is not how physicists have ever done this before. Um, they're absolutely flabbergasted that this is possible. Um, and it involves it basically inverting this, you know, again, massive, massive simulator. Um, we were a best paper. This was a best paper finalist at Supercomputing 19. It was a NeurIPS paper. It's the largest PyTorch uh, um, uh, in, inference net or uh, deep probabilistic program for the amortized inference artifact ever trained. We used 32,000 CPUs and we ran them for about a month to, to train the thing. Um, but it's all built on PyProb and all of you will be able to build PyProb by the end of the, the, the term. So this is a case study. We've got particle types and momenta. That's the latent variable. The, the, the Atlas detector response is the observed variable. And then like the model is this million lines of, of C++ code, okay? Now here's another example of where probabilistic programming is used. So we've got a, uh, a 787 undergoing um, uh, destructive wing testing. The wings are made of composite materials now. In fact, if you, if once COVID is over, you can actually go see a section of one of the wings over here in the materials building. Um, and it's pretty cool. That's thicker carbon fiber than you, than you might imagine. And actually the performance of these wings is very related to this in that the wings are cooked at a particular temperature and it's very important, just like when you're cooking muffins, that you cook them for the right temper at the right temperature for the right amount of time, so that they don't have they're not soggy and and structurally weak. So, how do they know whether or not the wing is not going to break because of uh, some sort of um, manufacturing defect? Well, it's actually a very complicated problem that involves inference. So, here's a wing part. Um, now, the the yellow uh, box here is a cross section through the part. The blue line is a cross section through the 2D cross section. So we're going to have a 1D section from the, from bottom to top. In particular, if you can see, uh, awesome, no mouse. Thank you, thank you, Zoom. Um, if you see where the blue line intersects the top part of the part, there's a like a, a, a stand that it's standing on. And then there's the part which goes from green to, to red. Uh, what I'm going to show you next is a uh, UBC affiliated company called Convergent, which, which uh, produces the world's best software for um, modeling over time the composite cure process. So we're going to put this wing part in a in, a, in an oven and we're going to raise the temperature of the oven or leave it in the oven for a little while. Temperature of the oven is going to fluctuate. Over time, 
what you see here is a, is a plot in which lighter colors, like the, the, the yellow color is hot, the dark, darker colors are cool. This is a complex simulation-based model uh, um, where the model is, you know, the, where the model is, the latents are the temperatures of the, the internal temperatures of the parts at all depths over all times. And the observes, well, we'll talk about what the observes are. The observes are rather interesting. You only get to put a, a thermocouple, a, 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 basically a thermometer on one side of the part and inside the air in the oven, okay? And you, and you need, if you see the red thermometer-like thing in the middle of, the, of, of the, the, the screen here, you need to know precisely what the maximum temperature and minimum temperature was in the part in the middle at a particular point in time in order to make sure that the 787 wing doesn't fall off, okay? So this is an inference process because you can't directly observe this. You can only do uh, inference through the model, right? You have to actually invert the model. Uh, the model comes in the form of a nasty, nasty simulator. Uh, and you need to be able to actually go backwards and infer what the temperature was given, um, given the surface measurement and the, the temperature measurement inside the oven. For various reasons we can go through, this is kind of cool. Uh, so this is posterior, this is, these are two different posterior estimates, one using straight um, inference techniques like we'll talk about in the course, the other one, the Q version being an amortized inference technique. They're, it, it math, they're numerically indistinguishable and the one on the left is super, super fast. So there's a case study, composite part, composite part temperatures over time, you can't see them. Um, uh, you can observe oven and surface temperatures over time, and we have a big numerical simulator involving all sorts of differential equations and solvers and so on and so forth um, that somebody else uh, built. This is C. elegans. It's pretty cool because it's the only organism in which the full connectome is known. It's also pretty cool because it's transparent enough that you can do calcium fluorescent imaging in C. elegans. So this is not playing particularly smoothly, but as the worm is moving, the roundworm is moving, you can um, actually measure parts of the, like about, you can measure about 25% of the, the neural activity of, of the worm as it's moving around. Neuroscientists are crazy. Um, using the tools and techniques of probabilistic programming, we can invert, uh, we can take um, a, wow, my computer is really, really hurting. We can take a, uh, uh, a model of the body of the worm and a model of the connectome, the full connectome, and condition it only on the neural activity observed in the upper right-hand corner, okay? So we know nothing about the shape of the worm, right? But by looking at what neurons are firing, we can go backwards and actually tell you what pose the worm was in. So in other words, we can literally read the mind, of, the mind of a worm, go backwards and infer the shape of the worm and of course, all of the other um, uh, neurons activity in the worm. So there's another, and we can keep going. So we trained uh, uh, the big PyTorch thing on this supercomputer at, uh, at in that's a, uh, in, at, at NERSC in the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs in, in the US. It was the fifth fastest machine in the world at the time. In order to make stochastic gradient descent work really, really rapidly, you have to infer the latent state of all the worker nodes on the machine. Uh, in other words, you need to know whether or not they're gonna go fast or not fast because if because of the nature of stochastic gradient descent, you can just not pay attention to some of the, the nodes. You can just drop them. And in fact, you get better training performance if you drop some of the nodes. So on the, the horizontal axis here are the number of worker nodes. So we were running relatively large parallel jobs with 2000 plus nodes. And we were looking at basically the, the, the runtime of stochastic gradient update uh, one step of a, of a mini batch computation. And you can see that there's a distribution over the runtime uh, across all of the nodes. And the red lines are, are, are critical points in which you should just not wait for those other nodes to stop. In order to model this, you need a, a deep nonlinear dynamical systems model in order to, to, to model this. This deep nonlinear dynamical systems model, we implemented in Pyro, uh, trained it using data from the machine, and basically had have the fastest parallel SGD implementation 
basically ever. And we use exactly the same model um, to model the behavior of flies and a bespoke probabilistic programming system basically to do predictive inference about where uh, interacting agents will be in the future, um, where the X's are where the flies are, time goes down, and these plots are of like, where does the fly go in the future given a history of where it was um, and our stuff is on is on the left so that's cluster computer state and future job processing times given the past processing times that's the same as where are the ants going to be given where they were here we actually use probabilistic programming techniques to learn the model simultaneously we have a spin out company one of the people in the in the in the in the room uh, in the in the classes is, is responsible for generating these results where we do multi agent modeling. Um, the initial implementation of this was in pyro we've done uh, we've we've moved away from that but we're using basically probabilistic programming techniques and deep generative models to learn models of 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 agent behaviors for autonomous vehicles blah blah blah. Uh, We've got RL. This is RL framed as inference, so we're we're training to drive cars from uh, you know so on and so forth. And we can keep we can keep going, right? The, you know, if you want meta learning for image completion, meta learning is basically the fundamental inference problem in probabilistic programming. Uh, uh, and here we have contextual pixels, so like single pixel, two pixel, three pixel, five pixel, ten pixel, fifteen pixel, so on and so forth. Um, and we want to do rapid amortized inference and a learned model that reconstructs uh, distribution over faces um, given the observed pixel values. And uh, what you see here are a sequence of samples drawn from an amortized inference artifact derived using probabilistic programming techniques, blah, 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 um, that um, uh, rapidly produce uh, posterior samples um, uh, in some some model, uh, so there is an in painting. You have observed pixels in an image, and you have a a, a learned model. Um, these are applications that I won't actually talk about uh, tomorrow uh, or or Thursday. Um, I can't actually stop the share for some reason. Okay. But the the struggle that I had when answering the question of like can you give me some applications of probabilistic programming? It's sort of like, can you give me some applications of math? <laughs> or can you give me some applications of whatever? It is an incredibly powerful tool once you understand what's going on. It's a hammer that you can use to basically bang any uh, uh, problem, okay? Uh, and it's really more about, there's like, there's like two things. And one thing is very difficult to, to, to teach in this kind of lecture format kind of thing. It's, it's like um, uh, figuring out how to think in the way that allows you to specify problems in the form of inference problems is maybe the most important thing that we'll try to do. And we get to do it in one lecture. So we'll do that basically next time. So like, how do you think and frame things in terms of inference problems? And the realistic way that that actually gets communicated is we sit down in a small room together and we think about your problem and we, we frame it as an inference problem. You do that two or three times and then you, then you know what you're doing. And once you can think in terms of framing things as an inference problem, as an abstraction, then anything that you can frame that way, you can solve using a probabilistic programming system. Uh, and what we're really going to be talking about in the course is how do you build probabilistic programming systems, how to use them, so on and so forth. And hopefully along the way, and experience shows that basically as you go through the course, you'll, the, you'll start thinking in this different way where you frame things as inference rather than optimization. And once you frame things as inference, then probabilistic programming systems basically become imperative. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Other questions? I have a good question. Yeah. I was just wondering if there is going to be a short break halfway between the lectures, like half in the halfway point in the lectures. You, oh, you mean like uh, Wednesday? <laughs> no. <laughs> in the hour and a half time slot, like a five minute sort of break to. Uh, all in favor of a five minute pee break during the middle of lecture? 
Uh, okay, uh, nays for a five minute pee break. Okay, we'll have a five minute pee break. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Oh, everybody, it's your opportunity. He showed up. Go for it on chat. Come on, this is this is great. <laughs> yeah, I, I must have known that was coming. <laughs> Part of me optimistically believed that I got away with it. But. <laughs> no way, man. No. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I appreciate it. It, uh, it, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I left home to go to a residential high school called the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy. Um, and we all sp stayed up all night and, and had all nighters and did all sorts of stupid stuff and learning all sorts of math and science stuff. And I remember my roommate Rajesh Govindaya fell asleep in one of our classes and we managed to, to, to actually literally move everyone out of the entire classroom and change the clock. Um, uh, and and all watch him as he woke up and had an absolute panic attack. I sort of feel like maybe we did a, something similar to that to payment now. It makes me feel happy. I suppose that's not a positive space thing, but I know payment can handle it, so it's okay. Um, uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> it's called search party. Nice. Um, cool. Uh, any other questions or comments? Um, anybody going to drop the course right away? I guess you won't tell me if you are. Um, it's been lovely. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, we'll take a we'll we'll take a so, break. So, sorry, Frank. Can I take your time for five minutes after the class? Or uh, yeah, I, yes, we can. I think sure. I can. We'll just stay on this, and I'll stop the recording. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>